Good afternoon. This is uh, Claire Epstein from Industry Safe, and welcome to our webinar on improving incident investigations. A couple of housekeeping issues before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, you also should be able to um, see a go to webinar panel and a PowerPoint slide that says improving incident investigations. Um, if you have any questions, just please use the question feature uh, and we will um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. And yes, this recording will be available after uh, the webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, we are going to begin. Um, so again, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar on improving incident investigations. Uh, what we're going to do today um, is we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're going to talk a very high-level overview about incident investigation, what type of incidents to investigate, the steps of an investigation, uh, some of the analytics uh, that are conducted in the incident investigation, and then we're going to show you a demo of how the industry safe software can help you with your incident investigations. Okay, um, hopefully everyone can see uh, see my screen. All right, um, just a little bit about Industry Safe. Uh, we're headquartered in Philadelphia. Uh, we uh, sell safety management software, and a big piece of that software is our incident module, um, which most of our clients use to conduct incident investigations. Um, we have had the software since 2004, and we have over 400 clients um, large, medium, small throughout the U.S. and throughout the world to use our software to keep track of their safety data. On the phone with us today are myself. I'm Claire Epstein. I am a chief, the Chief Operating Officer at Industry Safe. Um, I've conducted uh, safety reviews um, and helped uh, organizations with their incident investigation processes. Um, and I've also assisted our clients uh, with OSHA uh, record keeping and reporting. Um, also on the phone with us today is Josh. Uh, Josh is our Director of Customer Relations. Uh, he has over he oversees our customer support and implementation of Industry Safe, and he's very very familiar with the nuances of the Industry Safe software. So uh, jumping right into incident investigations, uh, what type of um, incidents uh, should you be investigating? Um, and so most. Um, organizations uh, focus a lot on employee injuries, uh, but of course, depending on your organization, uh, you may also be investigating non-employee injuries, uh, whether those are visitors or contractors, um, environmental incidents, if you're dealing with any hazardous chemicals, uh, vehicle incidents, if you have any type of vehicle fleet, uh, security incidents, if you're keeping track of that within your um, EH&S group, sometimes it's a different group, um, and then, of course, uh, as best safety practice, uh, near misses. And again, uh, the near misses, the idea that it, it, it wasn't an incident, but it, it could have easily been an incident. Um, it, it was a close call. So when you start an incident investigation, uh, there's four steps. Um, that's really considered part of the in incident investigation. Uh, before you actually um, investigate an incident, though, of course, you want to make sure that the uh, area where you're conducting the investigation, that, uh, that that area is safe. So generally, you might have the emergency response uh, team coming first. You need to make sure that the injured or hurt employee or contractor um, or whoever it is has the appropriate attention and that the area is safe. And then you can start the incident investigation. Um, so the first thing uh, you want to do in the incident investigation is you want to preserve and document the scene. You want to collect information. Uh, one and two are really done right away, uh, generally on scene. Um, and then the, the second two, de determine root causes and implement corrective actions, uh, may take a little bit longer depending on uh, what the incident is and how your investigation process goes. But the first two steps you really want to do immediately. Uh, so, in terms of preserving the scene, uh, you want to, um, when an incident occurs, uh, you want to sort of, you also want to secure the scene. Uh, you sort of preserve and secure the scene here to mean the same thing, but you do want to make sure that uh, no one else uh, interrupts and disturbs the scene um, and gives you an opportunity for you to take photos, to document your findings, 
uh, to examine any equipment and safety devices, and to know positions of machine guards and controls. And you definitely want to do this as soon as possible after the incident, because if you don't, then uh, equipment, machine, everything will change, and you won't be able to uh, do your incident investigation. I should also uh, back up and say, uh, from the safety point of view, uh, the whole idea of the incident investigation is to figure out what went wrong and to learn from your mistakes to prevent the incident from happening again. Uh, so you want it to be a learning environment. Uh, you don't want it to be uh, punitive, but it allows you to, to figure out how can you uh, improve uh, the safety of your organization. As soon as possible, you want to collect information about the about the incident, and a key piece of that is uh, witness in, uh, information, and you do want to conduct witness interviews if there were any, and you do want to do those as soon as possible so that the details and memory will be fresh, also so that the witnesses are there and available and you won't have to hunt them down later. Um, you do want to use open-ended questions, uh, interview witnesses, individually and then conduct interviews at the scene of the incident so again this helps you so you don't have to track down witnesses later but also that uh, they're right there um, and they can jog their memory and point out exact locations so a next uh, piece of incident investigation is to make sure you're collecting as you do your incident investigation uh, a whole series of common data points um, and we can um, talk a little bit about more of this more when we go into our incident investigation form in the software. There can be, depending on the type of incident, there can be numerous uh, types of fields that you can collect. Uh, so if it's an employee injury, uh, then you're looking for the, the basics about the employee who was injured, name, date, uh, job title, what they were doing, date hired, and all this stuff is helpful because it helps you with trends. And then obviously if it's OSHA recordable, we're not talking too much about OSHA recordable right here, but uh, you know, if you do have an OSHA recordable incident, in addition to the incident investigation, there's the whole OSHA recordable piece uh, that you have to uh, go along with as well. Um, you do want uh, information about the incident, uh, some common fields or description of the incident, the location, conditions of the scene, how the incident occurred, and root cause analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about root cause analysis in a minute. Um, obviously, depending on the type of incident, uh, you may have more fields. So if you have a vehicle incident, you're going to have questions about the vehicle, what type of vehicle it was. Uh, the license plate of the vehicle, the driver, what was the driver doing, what was the vehicle doing. Uh, if you have multiple vehicles, again, if it's an environmental spill incident, you may have very specific uh, fields about the environmental, um, uh, what, what was spilled, uh, what kind of hazard was it, how was it cleaned up, was a response team called. And then similar to a security incident, you may have security type questions. So again, depending on the type of incidents, you, have, you may have more or less uh, fields on your incident and for your incident investigation. Um, a big piece of incident investigation is uh, a root cause analysis. And as I was saying uh, before, it's generally the initial incident investigation happens right away. Um, and it may take a couple days or a little bit more time. Uh, sometimes there's a team of people who might look at the root cause to do the root cause analysis. Um, and really, you're trying to figure out what the underlying or systematic cause of an incident is. And there's all sorts of literature and courses on root cause analysis. Um, and I'm really doing a very brief overview. So there's a lot more to it um, that you can delve into. But you're pretty much trying to look at what happened, how did it happen, why it happened, and what needs to be corrected. And this is a very, very simple example of a root cause analysis uh, where an employee slipped um, fell and hurt his back. Um, and so you could see as you go through in this scenario, and there are different ways to do root cause, uh, but you can see how you can get an immediate cause, the floor was wet, a primary cause, janitor did not properly dry the area, a secondary cause, and a root cause. Um, so again, there's lots of different ways to do root cause, but this is just an example of a simple root cause analysis. And again, here are some all the different uh, tools that folks use when they try to do, when they do root cause analysis. As I said, it might be a team of people. There'll be checklists. There'll be event trees. There'll be timelines, sequence diagrams, etc. 
Another piece or key piece of the incident investigation is not only doing the incident investigation and figuring out the root cause, but again, the whole point is to help create a safer environment. So it's making sure you um, have corrective actions uh, to prevent that incident from happening again. Um, and sometimes it can be, a corrective action could be, you know, we want to train uh, individuals on, uh, if someone hurt their back on safe lifting techniques, it might be um, different tools uh, for a job. So there's all sorts of corrective actions you can do. Uh, corrective action itself can be quite simple. Um, you have what the action is, who's responsible for it, uh, when it should be complete, and you track the status of your corrective action. Another piece of incident investigation, um, hopefully you don't have a lot of incidents, uh, but especially if you're including near misses, uh, which a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks do, then there are some common incident metrics uh, you might want to look at uh, to figure out how you're doing with your incidents. Uh, so as you go through that root cause analysis, of course, looking at your incidents by root cause, uh, looking at your incidents by location, uh, another good one is average time lag in reporting incidents. When you do have an incident or near miss, you want to report it as soon as possible. The quicker an incident is reported, uh, the sooner uh, folks can uh, figure out remedies uh, for the incident and the less uh, overall the incident will cost. Uh, there's incidents by time of day. Um, of course, if you are looking at the OSHA record keeping side of it, there is a specific OSHA incident rates, your total case incident rate, your days of wage restricted transfer rate. And then there is also a, a typical incident pyramid, which shows your near misses, for example, at the bottom of the pyramid, and then hopefully very uh, much uh, as your incident get, get, incidents get more severe, a lot fewer of them. And that's based on the principle is that you may have a lot of near misses before you actually have an incident. So you want to be able to t tackle all parts of the pyramid. So uh, the next piece, we're talking a little bit about how safety software can help you. Um, you do, uh, as you're going through your incident investigation, it's a lot of data uh, for you to collect. Um, and you want to make sure that you're collecting all the data in as easily as possible. If you also are, have multiple facilities who are conducting incident investigations, you want to make sure you're doing it consistently. Um, so software can really help with that. Um, it can help you track the, any corrective actions, and it can help you generate metrics and summary reports. It can also help you notify. A lot of clients use their software to notify uh, team members when an incident occurs. Uh, the idea is that use uh, industry safe software, you get re reduced lost days, property equipment damage, insurance premiums, lost payouts, and regulatory fines. Um, so as I mentioned before, industry safe has a whole suite of safety modules, but really what we're focusing on today are those that help you with incident investigation. Uh, so Josh is going to show you um, how our incident module and forms work. We're also, if we have time, going to show you our incident mobile app. We allow you to collect and conduct incident investigations in the field. I mean, that's a lot of times if you have a vehicle fleet, um, that's where incidents are happening. So you can conduct an incident investigation offline if you would like. And we have a whole series of dashboards that let you see your metrics and then reports uh, for both incidents and corrective actions. All of our software has general functionality uh, features that help you with your incident investigation. As I mentioned before, you can notify uh, team members when individuals, uh, when incidents occur. You can upload witness statements, site diagrams, uh, medical records to an incident. So you have all of your incident investigation, um, all the information with an incident investigation in one place. And then you can also query and search the data uh, to uh, to, to look for your trends and incidents. Uh, with Industry Safe, it's software as a service. It's available anywhere there's an internet connection. It's available 24-7. Um, in fact, if you use our mobile app, you don't need the internet connection. Um, we handle all support issues. We maintain a backup data in a secure data center. And we apply updates to the software two or three times a year. It's simple, it's easy to use, and it's cost effective. Uh, we do have some resources here to help you with uh, incident investigation. We have some blog articles on the four stages of an incident investigation. We have one on the importance of near misreporting. And then also for OSHA record keeping, we have a very detailed OSHA record keeping guide. Um, so, um, 
there are a couple of questions. I'll answer those privately. And while I do that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh, who's actually going to take us through the incident investigation uh, component of industry space. All right. Thank you, Claire. Just give me a moment. I'll get my screen shared. And uh, as Claire mentioned, I am going to attempt to uh, try to show you our mobile app as well. But I definitely get you um, get you a preview of of our incident forms. Uh, talk through a little of the um, analytics and, and indicators that uh, if you're putting that data into the software, uh, Industry Safe can just create for you, uh, and then uh, see if additional questions come up uh, before we segue potentially into that mobile app. So bear with me. I'm just trying to get my screen shared here. All right, so as I look down through the attendees list, um, I see a couple familiar names that have worked with you in the past, but there's uh, also a bunch of new names that I haven't uh, haven't been pr privileged enough to work with you, or you're not one of our existing clients. Um, no fear there. Um, everything that I'm about to show you and walk through, um, whether you're an industry safe client now or not, uh, you can get to a demo environment, uh, allowing you really to, to play around with not only the incident component of our software, but really the entire software suite. Um, so if you are monitoring my screen, you should see our um, industrysafe.com marketing website, www.industrysafe.com. Um, from here, you can actually, uh, looks like there's a little bit of latency, but there's a free demo button, uh, normally in bright orange there. You can go ahead and click on that. And it'll take you to uh, an area where you can log in, uh, or sign up for a username and password. Uh, the Industry Safe demo site will send you your credentials. You set a password, and there'll be a hyperlink in that uh, to get you to the screen that you see right now, which is our main login screen. So feel free to uh, sign up for that demo account if you're not an existing Industry Safe client. Even if you are and perhaps are not utilizing our incidents module, uh, you can still feel free to sign up for a demo account and um, obviously talk to talk to someone on our team to uh, get that component added to your software. I'm going to go ahead though and log in with my demo account. And upon logging in, um, you will see that you're taken to the um, home module of our software. Again, uh, this webinar, of course, does have a topic. So while I would like to, you know, spend the next couple hours talking through all of the components that you see across the top home dashboards, et cetera, uh, I'm really going to be spending most of my time in the incidents module, segueing into the dashboard component as we wrap up. Uh, so as the topic really is, uh, you know, incident investigations, uh, we will navigate over to our incidents module. Uh, within the incident module, uh, very similar to all the other ones, you're going to have a, a centralized summary screen that essentially houses uh, all of the existing incidents that have been entered by you or other members of your safety team or just workforce in general. Uh, the incident summary screen by default is going to show you the previous 30 days worth of data. Uh, there is a search magnifying glass located at the top of that summary screen. Uh, in clicking that, it'll give you a menu option where you can, of course, you know, manipulate, hone in on a certain week or, or date range that you might be looking for. Our default is, you know, 30 days. But again, if you wanted to see everything from the beginning of the year, you could obviously type out a date or use that calendar feature. You could set multiple filters at once. Uh, so Claire touched on a little bit about the idea of, you know, creating corrective actions after you've conducted an investigation. It's, it's very common in your line of work. Um, so perhaps you want to see, you know, all of the incidents this year that have one or more open corrective actions. That easily, a uh, couple quick clicks, clicking that search button one more time, uh, it's going to then pull back any uh, incidents that fit that criteria. So you saw I maybe had 100 or so incidents in the last 30 days. Uh, now opening up the date range, honing in on one or more open corrective actions really only produces a list of 11 incidents that fit that criteria. Of course, um, each incident is hyperlinked, uh, so you can actually click into it to view the details of that particular incident. Of course, I will show you that as I'm going to put in an incident from scratch, but you can see here, of course, if I wanted to go into this incident, uh, you can start to see the makeup of who was involved, uh, what type of uh, incident it was. You see the various forms and even corrective actions, potentially photos, all stemming from what we call here our Choose Incident Form page. 
to add in a new incident, uh, industry safety function is out of the box, uh, you're going to have a, an initial incident form. And then if the incident calls for it, you will be able to move into an investigation. Uh, I have many clients that, you know, don't necessarily, just because you have an incident doesn't mean you have to conduct an investigation. Take something like a near miss. Uh, while I do have some of my clients that will say, look, doesn't matter if it's a near miss or a full-fledged employee injury, we're gonna investigate it. Uh, but on the contrary, I have clients that say, hey, it's a near miss. It doesn't need to be investigated. All part of your safety culture, uh, either way, industry safe can accommodate it. So it all starts with clicking the green plus button and you're gonna come to what we call the initial incident form. If you take a look at it, guys, what happened, or maybe a dozen fields that you're completing, uh, the idea behind this is to get the ball rolling. Um, not only is this a short, sweet form, really gathering the who, what, the where, right? So we're asking who the involved employee is. We're gonna say, where did it occur? When did it occur, date and time, and uh, high level details about what happened. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more of that in a second, but again, very short, sweet. You wouldn't even necessarily need to be a safety professional to at least get this incident started. After you have filled out this initial form and hit the continue button, you're going to generate a, an incident number within our system. Not only do you have that now in stored in industry safe, and then you can move on to that investigation whenever you're ready, it also will start the communication that comes out of industry safe. So all of any incident that you put into the system can actually trigger an email alert to go to the masses or select people within your organization, depending on how you want to configure those. So this is really designed to, again, get the ball rolling. It's not the, the nitty gritty details of, of you know, what Claire's slide deck got into. That's in our investigation, but you do need to at least get the who, what, where, and in, in industry safe, we call that our initial incident form. As you'll see, guys, so, you know, there's a little bit of back-end work that you need to do to, you know, get your employees in the system, but watch this. I start searching for all the Percellis. Uh, here, there, looks like there's three of me. Um, I find myself. Uh, if you store this information in the system, uh, in industry safe, it's going to know my name, my ID, my job title, as you see. It also knows that I work in the buildings, water, and infrastructure facility that fall within this division, region, and business group. So just by putting in my name, it will essentially kind of query your HR system if you have that kind of integration set up and autofill who I am at the time of this incident occurring. So that really takes care of that left-hand column just by searching for my name. Uh, we want you to get your incident in the system as soon as possible. Again, there could be a lot of communication. We have many clients uh, and companies of ours that say, look, you, you know, an incident occurs, it needs, communication needs to come out within 24 hours. Well, it will do that. Get that incident in there within a, uh, in a 24 hour period of that happening. And within an hour, industry safe will send out an email alert. So we auto fill the date here, but of course we understand that, you know, you can't always be at a computer in the line of work that you do. So you can of course backdate incidents if need be. Uh, you want to put in a time of incident, we'll accept both 12 and 24 hour clocks. Uh, an incident type, you can take a look at this list, but if you're looking at this and saying this makes no sense to you, none of these incident types adhere to our, our business and our industry, this is a completely configurable drop-down. So if you don't have fires, uh, this option in this drop-down can be removed or replaced with something completely different. So you would work with you know a member of my implementation team to define this list, and, and you can see here that people have just come in and doctored this up. This is, this is not our default list. Uh, but uh, you do have the flexibility to alter that as you see fit. So today I'm going to put in a, a serious injury OSHA recordable. You come to four key questions, and in relation to today's topic, the investigation, you really, really, really need to pay attention to these four questions uh, within an is industry safe. These questions are going to drive how in-depth your investigation is. It, a lot of times people want to um, focus in on the incident type, and, you know, again, this is a configurable dropdown, so... I've put serious injury slash OSHA recordable as an option that I want to see, but that drop down is not going to actually uh, spark the sections and areas on our investigation to make the incident OSHA recordable. Uh, it really falls into how you're answering these questions. This is how industry safe can accommodate the variety of incident types that you may have. Uh, you can of course imagine that you could have a vehicle incident. Well, Claire was in the vehicle with me and Claire was injured. So now I have an employee injury, 
property damage, and a vehicle injury, all in the one occurrence. Well, industry says it's only going to let you choose one incident type, but just think of the nature of what I described. We would be saying yes to a vehicle involved. We'd be saying yes to property damage, um, potentially a non-employee injury. Of course, I'm going to say yes for today. And then uh, was property damage involved? Uh, so again, these four questions are going to drive how in-depth your investigation is. In other words, if you say no to a vehicle involved, we're not going to bother you with vehicle questions. There's no need. You, you told us there wasn't one. Um, similarly, you know, you can't have an OSHA recordable incident if there wasn't an employee injury. Uh, so here kind of goes in, in hand with what I was saying. The incident type is not driving your investigation. It is literally these four questions. You say yes, you're going to be asked details about that particular question. Then you come to initial incident description, which is, again, designed to be what you know when you're entering in this incident. And the reason I say that is you're going to see on the investigation, you will be able to expand upon this. So again, it, you know, look at the nature of this form. Frontline employee John Smith could probably fill this out. He doesn't need to be a safety professional. You could utilize, depending on, again, your safety culture and how you're involved your employees get in it with safety in your organization. Um, you could have Heck, you could have the injured party fill out uh, this initial form uh, if you wanted to. And then, of course, you, that's when you want your safety professionals to get in uh, and focus on that investigation. As you see, out of the box, Industry Safe will assume that you want an investigation for this incident, so that box is checked by default. If, again, you don't investigate near misses or whatever type of incident that you happen to be entering, as you see, you can, of course, uncheck that box, and this would be it. This would be your incident form, just what you see on my screen right now. Uh, however, sticking on topic, we will leave that box checked. I will hit the Continue button. Not only now have I generated an incident number, we, we preface that with the FY and then the year, fiscal year, and then 19, and then we just do a running count. So now I have an incident number, and as I've been talking to, within an hour, my boss, Claire, can get an email that, you know, Josh Purcelli has been involved in an incident. So that's that communication that I was talking about. That's where we really push, get the incidents in as soon as possible, and let industry safe do that dirty work communication for you. Uh, you don't need to send that text or, you know, draft up that email. Industry safe will kick it out uh, on your behalf. So again, you've seen this already. Uh, this is what we call the Choose Incident Form page. As you see, it looks like I will be able to add attachments, claims, corrective actions. I can even link two incidents together. Um, as you see, some basic details about the incident, but for today's purposes, we are going to move on to that incident investigation form, sometimes called a supervisor form. Uh, again, depends on the uh, typically the industry that you're working out of. Uh, so, in my example for today's purposes, obviously presentation-wise, um, I said yes to all four of those key questions that I was harping on on that initial form. That, in turn, means that Unfortunately for today, you guys are seeing the longest incident investigation that Industry Safe could produce for you. Uh, again, keep in mind, if I said no to property damage, we're not going to bother you with the property damage questions. Uh, so therefore, this property damage section that I'm highlighting here wouldn't even be seen. You, As the user, you wouldn't even see that section available not be bothered with it, so on and so forth. Similarly, if I said no, no employee, no non-employee injuries, um, I wouldn't have the non-employee injury section, so on and so forth. Uh, we will carry over a lot of information from the initial incident form. So, as you see here in the in my uh, uh, top half of the investigation form, there's a lot of grayed out fields, like my title, the involved employee name. Uh, incident type, that date, the time, that initial description. All of that carried over from that first form. Uh, the idea is that you, know, you could have people who have access to the first form but don't have access to the investigation or, or you know, obviously you can have a user that have access to both. But if you do have, you know, certain people fueling in the initial incident data, you're not missing anything if that's all carried over to this investigation. Now, if you needed to make a change to something like the time, you would need to go back to that initial form and update it there, and then it would translate once you saved it. Uh, so coming down through, if, if I had the back end all integrated, it would actually know that, that Claire was my boss. 
so for my supervisor here, that could be auto-filled, but for today's purposes, I'll just search for her. As you see, I can do that. Moving down through the form, you get into more of the in, what we call incident details is our next section. So the idea that who it was reported to, well, you know, Claire doesn't work in the same office that I do, but I report to her. Perhaps I went to, you know, another manager to tell them that I was involved in this incident. So because Claire wasn't there, I went and, you know, talked to my good buddy, Gabe Tompkins. And that's who I actually told that I was involved in this incident. So who it actually was reported to? It might be the supervisor from up above, but we give you the flexibility to uh, change that. A date reported, uh, we will call out our OSHA questions. So as I move through the form, uh, you will see OSHA related questions are, are highlighted out there in red. Uh, we actually do a, a wonderful webinar on just OSHA record keeping uh, that's out there if you guys wanted to take a look at that. Get into things like shift. One of the uh, details that, that Claire uh, kind of alluded to in her slide deck, perhaps it's something that you're not ever have tracked in the past, uh, but again, you know, use, utilizing industry safe, you could track shifts. And you'll see when I transition to the dashboards, we can start trending your incidents by that. Why is third shift always kicking out the most of our employee injuries or first shifts tends to be when we're going to have the most of our vehicle incidents because it's early in the morning and our fleets are out on the road. Um, you have a description of location and as I mentioned you can always expand on what was entered on that initial form. Okay, moving down through I do have a vehicle number so if I do have uh, a fleet I could start typing, you know, Ford or F-150 or whatever it might be, and it will start to pull back all of the vehicles that fit that criteria. Um, and then all of this information would autofill, such as the vehicle type, make, model, year, a VIN, action, and who was driving. There are more fields that are disabled right now. This is our, you know, what we give you out of the box, but you can get into things in your vehicle uh, section where you're looking at things like the, um, you know, points, potential violation that might have been, you know, cited by a, an officer, uh, some type of a charge. Uh, so that, that to me, I get into the idea of preventable versus non-preventable. Uh, I know if you have a vehicle fleet, that, that is definitely something that uh, you, you typically are monitoring. So this would be that section. Uh, we would really just turn on more of those fields that are off by default, giving you that flexibility. Uh, we even go so far, um, if you fall under DOT, uh, we can actually have DOT recordable incidents in here. Um, again, these fields are just turned off by default. So if I, I always forget the, you know, uh, I believe it's like a collision where the vehicle had to be towed and there's a couple other criteria. We have those questions verbatim <laughs> right from the DOT logs themselves and then uh, through our reporting, you can generate uh, a DOT log using our vehicle instance log as well. So we do capture that. Uh, we understand that there might be multiple vehicles, so you'll see these uh, other vehicle involved buttons. So if I was driving and slammed into Claire's vehicle, I could tag that other vehicle uh, here, and if perhaps Claire's vehicle slid into somebody else's, you know, vehicle after I hit her, you can obviously have multiple other vehicles, and it's as simple as clicking that add other vehicle button, and then you'll get a repeat of really the same questions that you were asked up above, the action, the make, the model, the year, who is driving, but we do get into ownership as well, understanding that, you know, if you know, I was driving the vehicle, but perhaps I borrowed Claire's car for the week. Um, you could tag that, you know, I was driving, but Claire is the actual owner, her insurance information, all that kind of stuff. So that's our vehicle section. Claire touched on witnesses. That's a big piece of an incident investigation. I see it spun two ways. While we have, you know, name, phone number, witness interviewed, and witness statements here, of course, you could fill out that information and add as many witnesses as you see fit. I've also learned in my tenure here that, you know, often you, you, uh, a safety department, uh, or just a, a corporate you know, agenda, if you will, that you want the witness statement in writing. You actually want, would want Claire to write something out on a piece of paper. You want her to sign it. Heck, perhaps you might have a form that, you know, you, you have a, a company letterhead on it or whatever it is, and you say, hey, Josh, as a witness to this incident, we'd like you to fill out this formal form. So you could obviously freeform type out what, you know, Claire said to me as a witness, but a lot of times what we'll see is, you know, see attached. 
and you'll learn below that you're actually going to be able to attach really any type of computer file that you'd like and often it's just easier to scan that in as a PDF, go locate it, and then just have it electronically stored to this incident uh, and you can go ahead and get rid of the, the paper. Uh, so witnesses, again, you can add as many as you like. Uh, we did talk, uh, we did say yes to an employee, a non-employee injury. So we don't get into too much detail about non-employee injuries, but we want to know the type of person they were. So as some type of a visitor, contractor, whatever it may be, of course, contact information and, and essentially what happened, the nature of that injury. Uh, very similarly, you can add as many non-employee injuries as you'd like. The big one is the employee injury section. As you comb through and take a look, if you are in any way familiar with OSHA record keeping, these questions should be very redundant as they are literally taken directly from those forms. So um, as you see, by answering date of injury or onset of illness, I'm actually completing my OSHA 300 or, or filling out the data point that's needed for my OSHA 300 injury occurring on premise, medical treatment received, so on and so forth, you guys can read. But um, just to pu pull out that, you know, by filling out this investigation, you're actually completing your OSHA regulatory forms as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind. It can really be a, a time saver uh, rather than having to go back and, you know, doctor those off in Excel or hand write them out on the uh, OSHA template that may be. Uh, so area of the body parts. So, you know, you get into back, you know, you know, legs, fingers, whatever it might be. Uh, and then, of course, you'll see some indicators later. Nature of the injury. So really what happened is it a, a fracture, a concussion, a contusion, a crushing, a laceration, puncture. We really have the, the whole gambit covered. We mirror a lot of these things off of, uh, pardon me if I don't get the acronym right, but it's the workers' compensation standards that are out there. So again, if anybody listening, you know, does work in risk or workers' comp, um, these should really be verbatim for something you might see on a first report of injury um, and, and uses those workers' compensation standards. Same with the body part fields, our cause of injuries. Again, just to take a quick peek in there, these should mirror if you've done any work in workers' comp, uh, you know, fall, slip, or trip. Uh, you produce a list of things that you could fall, slip, or trip from. Please, uh, again, any of these drop downs that I'm clicking into are 100% configurable. So if you did not have um, a need to have motor vehicles as a cause of your injury, then we could, of course, completely remove that drop down option and the subsequent child records that or child values that fall underneath it. Uh, and similarly, if you do have vehicles, but maybe you don't have airplanes, <laughs> uh, you could, of course, you know, doctor or remove up these drop downs as well. Just keep that in mind. Nothing's really set in stone in our system. Uh, there's a lot of configurability uh, throughout the system. Uh, OSHA recordability can be determined here with our consequences of injury or illness checkboxes. You can check as many of these that apply. And as you see, depending on the checkboxes that you're checking, by selecting missed a day, it's going to need to know my missed date range. Uh, I can do non-consecutive date ranges. Uh, and then I also selected restriction of work. Well, it's going to need to know my restricted work ranges as well. Of course, I can add and remove those as see fit. As you see here, I'm using my calendar feature to pinpoint that, you know, in this example, Josh Purcelli has missed five days uh, for this particular incident. Moving down to the medical treatment area, uh, really completing your 301 uh, and also getting to, into the OSHA reportability option. Uh, that idea that you need to actually call into the local OSHA office if the employee was treated, um, sorry, if the employee was hospitalized overnight as an inpatient or if they suffered an amputation or loss of an eye within 24 hours of the incident. I believe it was in 2015. Uh, OSHA came out with the OSHA reportability. So recordable, uh, all OSHA Reportable incidents are recordable, but OSHA recordables aren't necessarily reportable. Reportable are more severe OSHA recordable incidents. Moving down in to our record keeping and reporting section, again, uh, you know, filling out your OSHA forms, um, what object or substance harmed the employee, describing your injury or illness and the body parts affected um, that made the person uh, injured or ill. Uh, again, directly from your OSHA 300 and 301 reports. Down into a work behavior section. So I know it's a lot of detail. Claire talked about it. This is this is all good information to be grabbing, though. 
Um, so time employee began work is actually a OSHA question. But then you're getting into things like was an allegedly defective tool or equipment involved? And as you see, depending on how I answer these questions, we're, we're going to continue to pry and keep pressing and ask for more. Well, you told us there was a defective tool involved. We want to know how that tool or equipment caused said injury. Uh, was the unsafe or defective tool reported? If yes, we want to know to whom and when was it reported? Is the employee trained to even use this tool? Um, were safe rules and safe practices being followed? If you say no, we're going to want to know why. Did the employee's act or omission contribute to this? Yes, we want you to explain how many hours did they work that day? You see a repeat offending. Well, no wonder Claire is involved in three incidents in the last two months. She's putting in 15 hour days. Uh, she's probably a little exhausted kind of a thing. We should give her kind of a break. Um, safeguards or equipment being provided. Actually a first report of injury question. Uh, were they being used? And then was PPE required? Watch this. I say yes. You guys will be able to configure these series of check boxes. Uh, so if you don't have high visibility vests, uh, you'll be able to swap those out with, you know, a, a P PPE that is applicable to your line of work. A couple more sections here. Uh, getting into the big ones, though, in the eyes of safety. Uh, property damage is because of us saying yes to property damage. We're really just looking for dollar amounts. Did you have any type of responders? Um, so fire, EMS, or police or security, either internal or external, uh, arrive on the scene. Uh, if you're saying yes to either of those things, you're getting uh, the ability to put in some form of a report number. And then again, just keep in mind, you can add attachments. So uh, more often than not, I've seen pol a police report or you know uh, something along those lines scanned in uh, and actually attached. Claire touched a lot on the root cause component. Uh, Industry Safe gives you tons of flexibility with root cause. I, I've seen everything from the five Ys clear to the tap root system. Um, now we're not as sophisticated and as in depth, I would say, as the tap root. But between um, you know the the brains of my implementation group, we we have been able to you know come up with workarounds in ways that um, whatever root cause analysis approach that you might like. Uh, we can typically find a way to get it into your system. Uh, so out of the box, we we ask for primary causes with the idea that you would lead up to a root cause. Now our primary cause here is very similar to witnesses, and you see I can just continue to click, 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 and you can even see someone who's gone ahead and configured this uh, out of the box. This would say, you know, initial, you know, primary cause would be where you see five Ys, and every time you hit add primary cause, you'd get another drop down. Well. We've configured this to be, you know, the field label says five Ys, but again, I could come in here and say, you know, poor lighting, uh, lack of training, so on and so forth were, you know, contributing factors or primary causes that all led up to an end all root cause. Uh, again, completely configurable drop downs. Uh, we've done and doctored up these drop downs uh, tenfold, uh, and it really comes down to, you know, do you follow that approach that you can only ever have one root cause uh, or as I'm learning and you know times change kind of thing that you might you might need or have multiple root causes for a given um, for a given incident and uh, industry safe will allow you that flexibility really with buttons like this and I should also mention that there are actually three more buttons like this um, so if you want to think of this as add primary cause there's Another button called Add Secondary Cause. There's one called Add Contributing Factors. And there's even one called Add Intermediate Causes. Again, don't be hell bent on the field labels that we give you out of the box. Um, just like we've changed the primary cause here to say five Ys, you could call these buttons whatever you like. So if you didn't like secondary cause and you wanted that to say contributing factors, that's fine. You just wouldn't use our contributing factors field and you could rebrand the secondary cause field. Uh, and as you see, you don't need to use all four. Uh, you can use one, two, all four, and even you know five if you include the root cause. But again, it comes down to, you know, this isn't a multi-select dropdown, whereas with this but button functionality, you could technically have multiple causals. Um, depending on how many you want. Uh, drug and alcohol test, we asked that, some comments for additional remarks. And then something I think that, that goes overlooked, and I, I love that Industry Safe does this, if you're, if you're using our training module, 
Uh, we have a training tracker. We have training content. There's tons of marketing information out there if you're curious. But as you see, I, I am the involved employee, and I am tracking my training here in the industry safe application. So it will literally, as you see, these are all the trainings that I have done over the last two years. Um, so this is really a way to cross analyze. You know, you know, we know Claire was working four straight 15 hour days, but she was on a forklift and as I peruse through her training, she's never been certified to be on a forklift. Maybe that was the reason, not that she was you know, working 60 hours in a matter of four days. Um, so this is a way, again, as a safety professional, you would have this information readily available at your disposal, and then even the option to come in and say that retraining is required. So by saying yes, you could easily come down here and say, look, I'm sorry, Claire, we're going to have to put you through that OSHA 30 hour one more time. Um, so that is a way, again, uh, I like that it can kind of incorporate components, all, no, I wouldn't say all aspects of safety, but it pulls in a huge component, uh, potentially lack of training uh, is an underlying reason that this employee uh, was potentially injured. Moving down, very bottom of the form, a uh, couple of things that I just want to quickly show you before we transition to dashboards. Um, is the idea that uh, you can attach photos. So in our additional feature section, if I came here, I could set attach file. I locate and browse for whatever images that I would want. Let them load up. You'll see they'll turn green. You can give them, you know, a different name like you know, Claire's car or whatever it might be. And then, you know, injury photo or whatever you want to call it. And then once I hit OK, you actually see those thumbnails will show up on the hover over. And of course, I can click on them and see the full size image. Uh, furthermore, when you print out this uh, document, excuse me, uh, you'll actually see the images printed out there as well. You've gone ahead and done your investigation. It not necessarily mean that uh, there is an aftermath or follow up. Uh, what we call corrective actions in the safety world, right? So right from this uh, investigation form, you will have the ability to link a corrective action to this incident. That corrective action could be to fix the forklift um, that you know the, the doesn't have seatbelts in it or whatever it might be. The corrective action could just be to train Claire as she's never been trained on forklift safety. Um, our corrective action form is very short and sweet to the point. Um, it also, if it is linked to another record, in this case, incident FY19407, it will actually autofill a lot of the information for me. So it assumes that the corrective action probably stems where the incident occurred. Um, it'll pull over the description of location and even pulls in my problem, allowing me to give some recommendation. And then at the bottom is where I'm actually assigning responsibility. So here I would come in and say, all right, Claire, I can spell your name. Uh, you are responsible for this. So now I've assigned Claire this corrective action. I'm going to give her to today. I'm really strict and mean. So I'd like her to have it done by Friday. Um, and then Claire will actually receive emails that she's been assigned this action item. And then depending on how much time we give her, she can have follow-up emails reminding her. And then furthermore, if I actually tag a second level of responsibility here, so um, if I were Claire's supervisor, I could put my name as the second level. If Claire happened to miss her deadline of February 15th, in my example, I would start to receive emails that Claire was overdue, and I could you know, walk down and, and talk to her and see what's going on. Uh, now you'll see if I go back to the incident, uh, you see bring it back to this picture or this page one more time. Again, you call this the choose incident form page. Not only do I see Claire's car photo, her injury photo, I also see the corrective action that I've added as well. So I know it's a lot. Uh, I did need to take you through the entire investigation form, but I, before I segue into some dashboards, um, were there any questions on anything you saw on that investigation form? Okay. Segue in then to why you might want to put, fill out that entire form. I promise you we give you some great analytics and dashboards to look at. Um, not only do we give you stuff out of the box, unfortunately today I won't have time to take you through our, our reporting tools, but 
Industry Safe has a slew of various reporting tools, some of which even allow you to create your own charts and graphs, put schedules to them, and have them emailed to you in a PDF every Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning of all the incidents that occurred last week. So um, there are some bells and whistles that are out there, but uh, if you if you don't have the time or you know you're not super computer savvy or don't have time to generate reports, hey, we'll give you a hundred pre can dashboards right out of the box. Um, as you see, I'm going to toggle to really I like the uh, incident analysis tab. That that's really where it gets into some of Claire's uh, talking points in her slide deck. But you know, incidents by root cause. This is why you're filling out that incident, and I can actually drill down and see. Oh my goodness, it's at risk behavior is really what is fueling all of our incidents so far this year. Uh, of the 11 that we've had, three have we've determined as a team that at-risk behavior was our underlying root cause. I mentioned the body parts, so over here, again, this is the analytics that you might not know, you might not have with the current system or Excel process that you're using, whatever it might be. Um, again, you just can fill in out those forms and you can clearly see we, we definitely have a lot of uh, upper left arm injuries, uh, seven of our 35, um, and head injuries as well. They're tied for seven there. I can drill down even further and see the incidents that are making up those um, that slice of the pie, if you will. Uh, sliding over, though, I, I really like this incident analysis. And the uh, incident analysis tab uh, gets into a lot of metadata that, uh, again, it, depending um, on whatever systems you might be using, uh, or if you're using industry safe, you have this at your disposal. It does require, you know, to, to fill some back-end information in about your employees. But again, we have uh, a couple of means that you can do that via an automated process linking directly to your HR system, or even an Excel spreadsheet tool built in. But th this really gets into some cool stuff. So there, again, I'm going to hit that root cause one more time. But we also have those causal fields. So it's called instance by cause one, but that's the equivalent of our primary cause. There is a cause two, three, and four uh, dashboard panel as well. Uh, and then if you obviously are using those fields, funneling the data to give you a pie chart, you can add those to this graphic as well. So again, same, same show, hide options, right? Um, over in that middle column, instance by day of the week. So again, you know, it's looking like the, that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday time frame um, is when we're kicking out those incidents. Furthermore, time of day, for whatever reason, 8 a.m., people coming right in is, is when we're, we're sparking most of our incidents. Um, incidents by category, so you're having more employee injuries versus prop damage. Job title, again, you know, maybe you've never looked at the, um, the titles to see, for whatever reason, our sales analysts are the ones that are involved in the most accidents, perhaps because they're on the road all the time or whatever it might be. Uh, worker type, so you're kicking out, uh, you know, full-time versus part-time related incidents. And then, as I mentioned, there's that shift. I kind of alluded to that whenever I was filling out the investigation. And again, we're just going to give you that indicator right out of the box. Okay. Uh, so the dashboards themselves, you can filter them uh, by the layers of your hierarchy. You see here, you got a couple other filters like supervisor name and, of course, a date range. It does um, default to year to date. Uh, but you can, of course, save and apply various filters as you see fit. The final thing that we often get questions on is can you export them? There is an export option down there in the bottom left, uh, but a lot of times folks will use something like the snipping tool that's built into the Windows platform now uh, or, you know, the off-the-shelf brands of, you know, Snagit and whatever all those other variations are. But the idea is you can just grab a little screenshot if I wanted this indicator. I drag and drop, and then from here, I can take this indicator, draw on it, do whatever I like, add it to a PowerPoint, present, whatever it may be. Uh, are there any questions on our dashboards? Okay. So, unfortunately, um, I'm actually having a little bit of difficulty trying to get my phone to connect to the GoToWebinar. Uh, so unfortunately, I won't be able to take you through our mobile app. I will just talk to it that you do have the ability, um, if you go to your preferred app store, the Google Play or iTunes store, uh, you can download the Industry Safe mobile application. It's free uh, to download. And if if you have a username, you're already paying for the service. So there's no additional charge to subscribe to that. Uh, but to today's topic, um, you do have the ability to either just fill out the initial incident form, again, that who, what, where, uh, or by the end of this week, 
um, keep an eye out for our most recent mobile app update where you'll be able to go through the entire investigation all on your mobile device. And what's great is while if you have internet connection, good to go, keep running with your 3, 4G or Wi-Fi connectivity. But more importantly for you guys that find your incidents in very remote locations, you do not need internet connection to conduct that investigation. You can be in a completely air, airplane mode um, and you can actually still conduct it through the mobile app. It just stores it on your phone. And then once you have that connectivity, it'll push it off to the industry safe site. So please guys keep that in mind. We're, we're really excited about it and, and we're hopeful that the folks take advantage of it. So on that note, uh, I'll, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire for, for just a final wrap up or any quick, any final questions for me, I guess. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, this really concludes the webinar. If we can be of any assistance, uh, please uh, reach out to us. If you're interested in the incident investigation mobile app, which we are launching by the end of the week, reach out to us as well. Um, anything else we can do, please let, please let us know. Thank you so much. This now uh, concludes this webinar. Thank you.